Good afternoon, and welcome everyone to today's Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture. My name is Arvind Raman. I'm the Executive Associate Dean in the College of Engineering. Starting in 2018, uh, the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series invites some of the world's most accomplished and well-recognized faculty and professionals uh, to come to Purdue to engage with students and faculty in meaningful conversations about the grand challenges uh, in the discipline. And while they come here, they participate in two different events. Uh, one was a panel that all of you heard, uh, but also in a specific lecture that targets a particular topic as well. Uh, and to introduce uh, our speaker today in more detail, I'd like to call upon Professor Barrett Caldwell, the acting head of the School of Industrial Engineering. Thank you, Arvind, and thank you for staying after the refreshments. This is wonderful. Um, I, I, it gives me tremendous pleasure uh, to introduce Ronald Latanison, um, or Latinician, also true. Um, as it turns out, we have multiple areas of almost overlap, but somehow we haven't met until just now. Um, so prior to joining Exponent, um, where actually a couple of my former students went to work, uh, Dr. Latanison was the director of the HH Ulig Corrosion Laboratory in the Department of Material Science and Engineering, or Course 3, at MIT, and held joint faculty appointments in the Department of Material Science and Engineering and in the Department of Nuclear Engineering. He led the School of Engineering Material Processing Center at MIT as its director from 1985 to 1991, and he is now an emeritus professor at MIT. Uh, in April of 2015, he was appointed adjunct professor in the Key Laboratory of Nuclear Materials and Safety Assessment of the Institute of Metal Research of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. In addition, he is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's also a fellow of ASM International and of NACE International. From 1983 to 88, Dr. Latanison was the first holder of the Shell Distinguished Chair in Material Science. He was a founder of Altran Materials Engineering Corporation established in 1992, and he has served in several capacities as, at Exponent as principal and director of the mechanics and materials practice, Exponent's largest practice, as corporate vice president, and currently as its first senior fellow. I could spend a lot more time talking about his technical skill set and his experience editing uh, the, the bridge, the publication of the National Academy of Engineering Quarterly. I do want to remark, though, um, this is probably the third area that we didn't quite overlap. He has served as a science advisor to the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Science and Technology in Washington, D.C. He has also served as a member of the advisory committee to the Massachusetts Office of Science and Technology, an executive branch office to, created to strengthen the Commonwealth science and technology infrastructure with emphasis directed toward future economic growth. Dr. Latanison has served as a member of the National Materials Advisory Board, the National Research Council, and now serves as a member of the NRC's Standing Committee on Chemical Demilitarization. He was appointed by President George Bush and George W. Bush in June of 2002 to membership on the U.S. Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board. He was reappointed for a second four-year term by President Barack Obama. And I even wore my, my Boston Tea uh, cufflinks for you today. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Ron Latanison, speaking on the politics and engineering of nuclear waste management. Well, I, I, first of all, let me say I, I, I enjoyed that panel discussion enormously. And I, I was telling AJ, I thought you guys must do this all the time because it came off so beautifully. So my, my thanks to you, Mr. Moderator, and to the panelists. That, I thought that was just beautifully done. So thank you very, very much. 
Today, um, I do want to talk to you about a topic that I consider to be extremely important on, on many different levels. And I, I want to preface what I'm going to talk to you about by saying that a, that a great university, and Purdue is a great university, you educate engineers and technologists who can change the world. And your students can do that. I've met with some of them today. They can do it. But I'm going to challenge them. I'm going to challenge the students in the following sense. I'm going, to, I'm going to speak about nuclear waste, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to talk about radiation physics. I'm not going to talk about materials other than as much as I need to. The, the, the technology is not a mystery to you guys. What should be, and I think it unfortunately is a mystery, is the politics behind all this. So I'm going, to, I'm going to make a challenge. I'm not going to tell you what it is until I get to the end. Therefore, you have to stay and listen to this. But I am going to challenge the students today to follow uh, a suggestion. Um, I, you might be interested in a little bit of an, an idea of how I got involved in, in studying nuclear waste. Uh, it, it happens that I was, I was sitting in my office sometime early in 20, two, 2002. And the phone rang, and uh, my administrator came to my office and said, there's someone on the phone who says he's from the White House. And I said, well, I don't usually get calls from the White House. Maybe I should answer this. So I went to the phone, and I started, this fellow introduced himself, and he said his name was Alberto Gonzalez. And I, you know, I knew that the president's counsel at that time was <laughs> Alberto Gonzalez. So I said, um, you're, so you, you, sir, are White House counsel? And he said, yes, I am. And I'm, 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 I'm here to tell you that you've been nominated to serve as a member of the US Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board. And as part of the process of vetting, I need to speak to you for a few minutes. And he, I said, well, I'm, I'm honored. So thank you. Let's, what can I talk with you about? And you know, we had a very, very cordial conversation for about a half an hour. And about maybe 20 minutes through this conversation, he said, I have two fine, we talked a lot about technology and handling waste and nuclear power and so on. And he finally got to the point where he said, I have two final questions. The first one has to do with, he said, what is your party affiliation? And uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm a Democrat, registered Democrat, Winchester, Massachusetts. And there was this long pause on the phone. I said, well, there goes my appointment to the nuclear waste board. Mr. Bush is a Republican. But he came back on the line. He said, you know, nuclear waste is not a partisan issue. That, that doesn't matter. That's fine. Yeah, we, we'll welcome you to the board. And then he said, have you ever written or said anything in public that would embarrass the president? And I said, and this is true. I said, no, I have much too, much too much respect for that office to say anything demeaning about whoever's sitting there. I may have differences, but I would never say anything that would embarrass the president. And that's still my position. And I've been, it's been challenging at times, but it, that is still my position. So I got involved because I think, I think nuclear electric generation has a place in our energy mix. I really do. Today it produces, I think, something less than about 20% of the, the energy demand in the United States. Um, but I am concerned about the future. And that, so th this is in the context of looking forward. I am concerned because, you know, the first nuclear power plants have been operating now for almost 60 years. They're being relicensed. Their, their design life was 40 years. They've been relicensed for another 20. There, there's now conversation about relicensing for another 40 years so that plants will operate for up to 100 years. That, that's not unreasonable. There is often a difference between design life and operational life, and nuclear power plants could operate for 100 years. I'm convinced of that. But every year, a 1,000 megawatt nuclear power plant produces something like 20, 27 uh, tons of nuclear waste in terms of high-level waste in terms of spent nuclear fuel. Um, that's a lot of waste. And yet, 60 years into their operation, we still do not have a national approach to handling nuclear waste. I think that's irresponsible. I, I have said in public in many occasions, and much to the dismay of some of my nuclear friends, that I don't think we should build any more uh, fission nuclear power plants of any kind until we decide as a nation how we're going to handle the waste. 
Now, why haven't we, why haven't we gotten to the point where we can manage nuclear waste? Frankly, it's very straightforward. We have neither the political will or the public will to do it. And until we do, it, the country's at risk. You know, if there's, a, if there's an accident in handling nuclear waste, the, the, the risk may be low, but the consequences are enormous. And I don't think we can continue generating nuclear waste and, and continue doing, I'll show you how we handle it in a few moments, but I don't think we, we can continue generating it without having some, not only policy, but implemented plan for managing it. And I, I, that's so, so I'm, really, I'm really quite concerned um, that, that we, we know how to deal with it technically, we just don't know how to deal with it politically or socially, frankly. Now, my point in emphasizing politics, however, is broader than nuclear waste. Um, I, I think engineers have been sort of absent from the conversation about policy issues for far too long. We just don't get involved. It, you know, it's not in our wheelhouse. We're very comfortable in the laboratory. We're very comfortable talking to our colleagues who are experts. We're not so comfortable talking to policymakers, and yet we must. Because if we don't, their minds will never change. There will always be politics in the way, and the country's interest will never be served. And nuclear electric generation, it, it has many attributes that are, that are really important. It's green, doesn't produce any CO2. It's reliable. Nuclear power plants operate almost continuously, with the exception of the time when they're refueled. They just continue humming away. Uh, it's, and it's really, it generally safe. I mean, there have been accidents, but it, you see in Fukushima and Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, th those are the kind of low risk or high risk, low risk, low risk, high consequence events. And, but they make the point that we've got to deal with the kinds of issues that occur when, we, when nuclear power plants either fail or we don't handle the waste. So, um, what I want to talk to you about is the management. I want to put a little bit of a perspective on this first. You know, as you've heard in our conversation uh, during the panel discussion, the world is, it's becoming increasingly technologically intense. I mean, the last 50 years have been remarkable. The next 50 years will be astronomic, in my judgment, in terms of the introduction of new technologies into our, into our social fabric. Now, the world's population. We all need clean air, clean water, and f clean food, palatable food. That's, those are givens. Those are fundamental. But our standard of living depends on housing and shelter. It depends on health care. It depends on uh, a dependable infrastructure. And it depends on energy for both our homes and our workplace. That, that's the way I see the world today. There may be other dimensions. And I know, AJ, you had a, a beautiful chart, which I hadn't seen before that incorporated some of this and more, which I, I found very intriguing. I'm going to use that next time. <laughs> but that, that's where we're at. Now, so let's take the position that nuclear electric generation has a place in, our, in, in meeting our electric demand in the United States. Let's, let's take that as a given. How many reactors are there in, in the United States? Well, th this is a figure from the year tw uh, December of 2000. And frankly, it hasn't changed much. What it shows is the number, the number and location of operating plants in the United States. In 2000, year 2000, there are roughly 104 operating nuclear power plants in the US. Um, right now, there are actually 10 less, because about 10 of them have been decommissioned or are in the process of being decommissioned. Now, that, that's a troubling statistic. When, when President Obama was in office, there was a, there was a thought that we might be at a stage where there might be a nuclear renaissance. People were very interested at that point in history in nuclear electric generation. There, there, were, con there were congressional bills. The Department of Energy had given the bu been given the budget authority to provide loans to utility to build new electric generating plant, nuclear electric generating plants. None were built. There's only one nuclear, new nuclear plant which has been under construction forever in Georgia. It's still not operating, I think. Maybe, I don't think. It may be getting closer, but it's not operating today as far as I know. It's Vogel in, near, near Savannah. 
but in Georgia. So you look at this map and you see that they're concentrated largely, uh, let's say, east of the Mississippi, some in California. What, couple, there's a, essentially a power, there's a, a, a nuclear power plant in, called the uh, Washington Public Power System in the state of Washington. I think there are five reactors, there are planned for five reactors. But this is the distribution today. Commercial spent fuel, that, that is another way of describing uh, high level waste. Um, there are roughly 53,000 metric tons of spent nuclear fuel in the United States today. There are about 8,500 8, metric tons in dry storage. And remember, every year a nuclear, a nuclear power plant, 1,000 megawatt plant, produces about 27 metric tons of waste. So if you've got about 100 of them, you're pr producing about another 2,700 metric tons a year. Uh, the projection is that by the year 2035, there will be a, about 100,000 metric tons of waste in the United States. Now, to give you some perspective, I mean, this is very dense material. It's about the size, if you think about this volumetrically, it's about the size of a football field and 30 feet deep. That sounds like a lot, but it's really not that much. It sounds astronomic, but it isn't. But it has to be handled very, very carefully. And as I say, we do not have a policy. Uh, we do have a policy. We don't have a, an implemented plan for, for handling it today, at least not in terms of permanent storage. The plan was to produce, uh, to, to build a geologic repository and to uh, introduce about 70,000 metric tons, 63,000 of which would be commercial uh, spent uh, fuel from nuclear commercial power plants, about 7,000 metric tons of defense high-level waste. That was the plan. Here's, here's where it is today. It's stored on site in, on where these, are. there are 67 sites in the United States where these roughly 100 plants are located. In some sites, there's more than one reactor. But the, the fuel, when, it's, when a nuclear power plant is refueled, the fuel is first been, uh, put in what are called spent fuel pools on site. And the, 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 radio, the, um, the chain reaction has stopped. The fuel is no longer, well, not really stopped, but it's slowed to the point where it's not commercially useful. So even though the fuel uh, is not commercially useful, there's still a lot of radioactivity, radio, radioactive release of gamma rays and um, um, fission products that are produced and released. So that this, store, this fuel is stored, the bundles of fuel are stored in, on site in what are called spent fuel pools. And does anyone know why the water looks blue? Are there any nuclear engineers here? What's the answer? Hmm? Yeah, okay, Chernikov radiation. You know, you could swim in here. I don't recommend it, but I mean, the, the radiation is high, essentially high enough energy that the, the, the visible light is towards a, the blue end of the spectrum. And so that's why it looks blue, blue green. Uh, but it's pretty free of bacteria, you know, <laughs> given the radiation. So you could swim in it, but uh, maybe not your choice. Uh, after it's cooled to a certain point, it's put in dry storage. This is an example of, th this was actually taken, a picture I took at um, Maine Yankee. I got permission to take it. This is not illegal, I, I, can, I can show it to you. Uh, but these are spent. These were spent cask on a pad at Maine Yankee, which is in the stage of being decommissioned. It's pretty big. This gives you a size, a figure, an indication of the scale. Uh, you can see the, the woman standing next to it. So they're pretty big. They're pretty large canisters. Um, now, what are the issues? Well, uh, first of all, the consensus. You know when. When the world, and I mean the world globally, began thinking about how do we manage nuclear waste. Now, this did start maybe 40 years ago. In the United States, there was a National Academy Committee set up to examine what we should do with the waste. So it looked like we were headed in the right direction. And they considered uh, deep ocean burial. They considered uh, putting it in uh, space, you know, sending it up in space. And they finally decided neither of those were good options in terms of the biosphere, and so they chose not to do that, thank God. But they did think that the best possible thing to do is to put it in deep geologic repository, to bury it underground. And they went about examining, I think, more, more than a dozen different sites in the United States where 
uh, where, where, that they thought were potential sites for storage. Um, some, some of the sites they chose were where there were communities that were ex agreeable, uh, but the sites were, were not considered to be acceptable. Many were in places where the sites were acceptable, but the public wasn't, accept wasn't agreeable. So uh, it, 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 it became a, it clear that it was going to be a, a problem. Now, I showed you this before. I mean, so you're generating this waste. By year 2035, you're going to have about 100,000 metric tons, so that current football field with 30 feet probably grows to 50 feet or something like that. Well, where was the best site? Well, it turned out to be in Yucca Mountain, Nevada. Now, if you remember the map that I showed you a little while ago, let me go back to that. There are no nuclear plants in Nevada. None. Huh? Yeah, none in Indiana either. You don't want a nuclear waste repository. So what, did, what happened? So the people, of, the people of Nevada, and particularly the congressional delegation, decided that they, they weren't producing nuclear electricity, they weren't generating electricity using nuclear power plants, why should they serve as the repository for nuclear waste? Um, I, you know, interestingly, the, the people who lived near Yucca Mountain were not at all upset about this. They're, it's a very deserted place, but there are, there are population centers around it. There are small population centers. Yucca Mountain is about 80 miles from Las Vegas. At any rate, the congressional delegation at that point did not want to have nuclear waste in Nevada. Now, it also happens. This was during President Obama's first term. Uh, you might remember in his first term, during his first year, he tried very hard and did pass the Affordable Care Act. You might also know that Harry Reid, the senator from Nevada, was the majority leader in the Senate. And I think, I think it's common knowledge. I don't think this is a secret. I think President Obama needed Senator Reid's support for the Affordable Care, Affordable Care Act. Oh, they're both Democrats. But still, they had to make a trade. If I, I can't tell you for a fact that they had this conversation, but my guess is that the deal, the, the deal was that if you support the Affordable Care Act, then I will support you in opposing putting a, a, a nuclear waste at Yucca Mountain. You know, if I, were, if I were president at that point, I probably would have made the same choice. Look, the Affordable Care Act, it, 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 it provides care, care for 30 million people in this country. I mean, we've waited a long time for a waste repository. I suppose we can wait a few more years. So, you know, it is a political decision. But we've never gotten back on track. Here's, here's, what, we, here's what we have done in a policy sense. In 1970, I guess it was a little off in the timing, the federal government, at the recommendation of the academies, began screening many sites. They, they deferred on commercial reprocessing. Why did they do that? Because, you know, what, what happens with nuclear fuel is that when the, the uh, fission products are produced, some of the fission products are neutron absorbers. And what happens is that they poison the chain reaction in the fuel. And so after a, a relatively short period, something like about eight, a year and a half, about 18 months of service, there is enough fissional, uh, fission product uh, poison in the fuel that you have to, you have to either replace it or you have to reprocess it, remove the poison. That's what the French do. You know, 70% of, of French's, the, the French uh, electric demand is met by nuclear power, 70%. They reprocess the fuel and put it back into service. But one of the products of reprocessing fuel is weapons grade plutonium. And so uh, President Carter, who, who was president at the time of the, the decision uh, there, there was a reprocessing experiment at a place called West Valley in New York State. We, we actually experimented with reprocessing in the United States. But President Carter and the administration made the decision that it was not in this country's interest to reprocess because it would produce as a product weapons-grade plutonium that could fall into the wrong hands. I think that probably, once again, I think it was a, a, a sensible decision. The French are very careful about it. They're very guarded. but. You can see the potential uh, problems. Um, but in 1982, we did. In 1982, 40 years ago, we passed a nu Nuclear Waste Policy Act. That act said we are going to build, based on everything that had been done before that, 
a waste repository, a deep geologic repository. And we're going to begin charging nuclear utilities a fee, a waste, uh, waste management fund. So we're going to start charging you a, a fee. And by 1997, this deep repository will be built, and you will be able to deliver your waste to Yucca Mountain. Guess what? <laughs> it didn't happen. So this waste fund continued growing. By 1997, the utility started saying, well, what do we do? What do we do with our waste? It's sitting on our site. There was no good answer. So the utilities began suing the federal government to recover the cost, the funds that they'd put into this nuclear waste fund. It went, it went, you know, it was a disaster in terms of public policy. The policy was there. It was not implemented. The, the utilities did what they were supposed to do. They paid into this fund, but the fund did not provide access to a site where they could store waste. Here's Yucca Mountain. I want you to see just how desolate this is. This is 80 miles, basically 80 miles north of uh, Las Vegas. Uh, it's, it's uh, it, you know, it's a pretty desolate place. It looks like another planet when you look at these photographs. You know, there's little pockets of civilization, but it's pretty desolate. Now, here you can see, see some of the construction. The, the uh, this must be a pointer, is it? Uh, oh, there it is. There is a pointer, but I don't. I don't know if you can. Can you see it on a screen? Oh, okay. Well, let me let me just point out. You you can see a little bit of construction there. That was the beginning of a the the building the construction of what's called an ex exploratory exploratory tunnel. And the idea was here's the mountain. Uh, let's find out what kind of barrier the mountain would be if we were to actually put fuel in it. So the Department of Energy, which had the responsibility for this, started producing, they produced an experiment, they call it a drift, an experimental tunnel, five miles long into the mountain, about uh, 1,100 feet above sea level, about 1,000 feet above the groundwater, the ground, level of groundwater uh, in Yucca Mountain. And they started building, and they, they you know, spent billions of dollars doing experiments at, at this place. This is what it will, you know, the blue is what it should look like if it were completed. It never got to that point. The only thing that was ever constructed was the, the yellow. Uh, this is the entry, and you can, you can kind of see it's called a north portal on the experimental, uh, uh, experimental mm, something, ESF, I forgot what ESF stands for, but it's like the experimental tunnel. Here's the machine which used to produce it. It's a pretty whopping big boring machine. The industrial engineers will like this, right? Remember, maybe the mechanicals even more. It's, it was amazing. I went for a ride inside this tunnel. It was great. As part of the waste board's visit to Yucca Mountain, we actually toured the entire five miles. It wasn't a tour. We were working. Uh, but this is to give you an idea. So, you know, when you think about this, Nuclear plant, power plants have a 40-year design life. Um, they may be licensed, maybe let's say 100 years. So you, you, need, you need to think about that when you realize that this, is a, this, shows, the, this shows what is called a thermal pulse. When you, when you take nuclear waste and you, let's suppose you were actually going to bury it in Yucca Mountain. Let's suppose that it had been built out and you were ready to receive waste. Depending on the location, you would have a, a low and high temperature as a function of time. And so where, when you first put the waste in, it's very hot. It'll stay hot for about 50 or 100 years. You will keep the tunnel, you will keep the, the repository open for that first 100 years, so things cool and you get natural ventilation, and then you'll close it permanently. That was the idea. And the thermal pulse will decline. There will still be radioactive activity. Uh, radian nuclides are being produced, gamma rays, alpha, uh, uh, neutrons are being produced. There's energy release, so it's still warm. You wouldn't expect any sort of environmental, any, anything to happen. It's dry for the first 10,000 years until you get the, the, the boiling point in Yucca Mountain because of the elevation is about 96 degrees centigrade, not 100. But somewhere around 100 degrees, that's where the, boiling, the, the thermal pulse begins to reach a point where for the first thousand years, it's dry. You don't have to worry about it. It's what happens after that. But why is that important? How do you, how do you design a system to last a thousand years? 
I mean, it, the, the design life of a nuclear plant at most is 100 years. The operating life, most 100 years. Well, the answer is it's got to be done by probabilistic risk assessment. There's no other. You can't do experiments that are me really meaningful. It's just not possible. So there's a, you know, a lot of the work of the board and the Department of Energy, the Nuclear Waste Board, of which I was a member, and the Department of Energy, was focused on PRAs. Uh, the problem was we had this very long timeline. And th th there were two. There were the Environmental Protection, Protection Agency had the responsibility to decide what was the compliance period. And they said, well, there are two points that are important. The first point is what is a lethal dose? And they decided that after about 10,000 years, the, the radioactivity coming from the waste should be such that you would no longer receive a lethal dose. But as time progressed, and as, uh, as these canisters, the packaging, began to degrade, you know, the canisters in which the waste was stored, then there might be some radio, radionuclide release. And so up to a million years, you had to provide a demonstration that you could make sure the public safety was guaranteed. A million years. That means how many eons in geologic time frame? You know, the Department of Energy was actually considering what kind of signage to put at Yucca Mountain. What, what would another civilization look for as an indication that there's a buried nuclear waste? I, I mean, it, it was so unusual. For, for a practicing engineer to think about time scales like this, hard to believe. Well, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut this short by telling you that, well, let, me, let me show you a slide here. If the only, uh, this is the only material science I'm going to talk about. If the only process that occurred was uniform corrosion, that is like you put a piece of steel in the atmosphere and it corrodes uniformly, the whole, the whole surface becomes rusty. If that happened to the materials of construction of the waste packages, you would, get, you would see a difference. Th these two stacks show on the right, it shows the thickness of the wall of the alloy being used for the container at time zero and after a million years on the left. Uniform corrosion is not an issue. It, they would easily last a million years. That sounds outrageous, but if you use whatever data you can in terms of corrosion rates that are known not for these materials, under projected environmental exposure, they should last what easily last a million years. The problem is localized corrosion. And that's where, uh, this where things became very tough. And I think given the timing, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna tell you that from the point of view of the Department of Energy, they were concerned about localized corrosion because remember, after a thousand years, the temperature drops to less than 100 degrees. So it's possible for any atmospheric moisture to condense under the right circumstances. One of the concerns it has with deliquescence, that could occur above the boiling point. They were concerned about dust on the packaging being deliquescent. So, but that's not going to create uniform corrosion, it's localized corrosion. And that's where the Department of Energy was concerned, but they thought that the characteristics of the dust included not only uh, elements or species that could be corrosive, but they could also be protective. The dust was analyzed. So, and the bottom line was, they, they decided they could put packages into this waste. This is, an, uh, this is called an emplacement drift. Drift meaning tunnel. And it would have the spent fuel in packages. It would have a shield, an emplacement, uh, a shield above the packages to protect it from anything that might fall in the ground or anything like that fall on top of it. And these are just examples of what it would look like. It was, it was interesting. So here's, this is the final slide. Despite the delays, Yucca Mountain is still a viable option. It is. But due to the delays with repository development, large um, amounts of spent fuel will remain at reactor sites, at least in terms, probably for the next 50 years, unfortunately. So reprocessing, if we ever get to the point where we reverse the decision made by President Carter, then we might have an option to reprocess, but there will still be wastes. We're not going to, they'd be different, they're minimalized, but there still be wastes. So the end result is, um, is that uh, we, we've got this problem. Why, why haven't we got to the point where we can put this waste into the ground? It's because the 
political process has failed us. It really has. We've not come back to it as a nation. Long after affordable care, the Republican and Democratic legislators cannot agree on what to do with Yucca Mountain. They cannot. And therefore, it's stalemated. So the countries that, I think it puts the country at risk in terms of the power demand. It puts us at risk in terms of how we manage a very potentially dangerous waste. And this is where I come to my challenge. I've said time, several times today that engineers aren't nearly enough involved in public policy. You guys have to run for office. And when you do, and you get elected, you let me know, and I will come to your inauguration. How's that? Well, I'm, I, I'm saying that jokingly, but I really do mean it. You know, there are 535 members in the Senate and the House. I think you can count on one hand the number who have technical backgrounds. In a, in a nation which is so technologically intense, how does that make sense? Now, I, I know, you know, as, as scientists and engineers, we're very reluctant to get involved in that kind of, that, that kind of interaction with policymakers. There, there's, this, there's this famous quote. I, I don't know who it came from. Maybe Ronald Reagan. But it's, the quote is something like, you can always distinguish a politician from a scientist. The politicians are often wrong, but never uncertain. The scientists are the diametric opposite, right? We, are, we have lots of uncertainties. And therefore, you know, it's part, not part of our culture, typically, to become involved in public policy. But frankly, we must. If, if we don't get involved, then a nation is going to be led, a, a technologically intense nation is going to be led by people who have no technology background. I don't, I don't want every member of Congress to be a technologist, but I'd like to see more than a handful. And, um, I, you know, if, even if you, you do not run for public office, an elective office, there are policy-making positions that you can play in state government, in federal government, and frankly, they're really important. So I leave you with that challenge. I'm speaking largely to the students. I don't want the faculty to leave here, but Dean, Dean I, want, I, want, I want to assure you, Dean, I do not want your faculty to leave, but I do want the students to think about lives that involve public policy. Okay, that, thank you very much for being attentive. I appreciate it. Thank you. I think we have time for questions, yes. We, we do in indeed have time for questions. Okay. Um, so we want to make sure, again, that uh, those who are watching via the live stream to use the chat box for any questions that you have. Hmm. And the chat box is being monitored. And questions will be asked on a first come, <clears throat> first serve basis. While <clears throat> we are trying to um, stimulate the questions from the live audience and from the online audience, I will take privilege to, to ask the first one. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I think your discuss, discussion of Yucca Mountain is one of the perfect examples of the disconnect between a, not just the risk versus consequence, but the risk versus timeline. Yeah. So, um, Lots of, uh, shall we say, elected officials work on a two-year or less timeline, and they're trying to make a decision about hundreds of thousands of years, which means there's never incentive within any given term yeah. to do anything. Uh, how do you add that to the PRA assessment? <clears throat> Well, I mean, I think the first thing you have to recognize is exactly what you've just said. I mean, in order to make decisions, this has to be, uh, there have to be people in policy making and implementation positions who can go beyond a term of a political, of an elective position. This isn't a four or six year decision. And if, if we don't get to the point where there are serious, in addition, you need serious lawmakers. You need people who do understand the gravity of what we're dealing with. And by gravity, I mean, the demand for electric generation, the concerns about the climate, uh, and the need to make decisions and implement them. And until we get to the stage where all of those things come together, uh, that's why I said, I don't know that this will occur in the next 50 years. And if it doesn't, I don't think we should build any more nuclear power plants. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so 
we'll, we'll start with the student. <clears throat> uh, this is actually a little personal because I grew up near the San Onofre plant, the one of the two in Southern oh. California that yeah. closed down uh, after Fukushima because of concerns it was on a fault line. What are some things that, if we're going to be dealing with on-site storage for the next couple of decades, what are some things other than, you know, deep underground storage that these sites are maybe doing to make people nearby feel better? What are some of the, the security implementations and things we're going to look forward to that are not directly off-site storage? Well, let me, let me say first, I think that the very best technology is deep geologic report repository, but that could take several different forms. I mean, for example, I mentioned that Yucca Mountain, the plan was that it would be open for the first 100 years to cool, and after that it would be closed permanently. The fuel would not be recoverable. And yet, if we get to the stage in our history where some year or some, we'd make the decision we do want to reprocess, then that fuel is no longer available if it, if it can't be retrieved. There are other approaches which look at geologic repository but provide for reclamation or recovery if you choose to, if you want to. So I think, you know, there are a couple of different options. Uh, but I don't think we're at a stage where we can make any decisions on anything because there's no fundamental agreement on going forward with, you know, the Congress neither appropriates money or if it does, it doesn't, it doesn't go ahead and, and provide the money. It's, uh, we're, we're, at a, we're at a standstill. Thank you. So uh, your, your, presentation act your presentation actually uh, inspired an observation, the word waste. And just four different waste quickly came to my mind, nuclear waste, electronic waste, space waste, and plastic waste. If I connect dots in all four of them, there are different types of waste, but I think it may have partly partly, may have to do with how we start engineer something to build from fundamental bottom up. Because when we engineer something, we don't factor the waste as a part of engineering specification to start with. And I think that goes to how we consider the life cycle of a product but not the material. We are talking nuclear as a material, plastic material, space yeah. junk as a material, and electronic waste which was in many other countries we shipped. But it was that we look at the life cycle of a product, but not a life cycle of a material. And I think that may be one of the opportunities. The problem is an opportunity. But just wanted to uh, but, share but that observation. You, how, would you, how would you handle nuclear waste with that perception? Uh, concept? You made a comment, very interesting, that in France, the 70% of their energy come from nuclear, but they do put back, reprocess nuclear fuel back into the plant. Yeah. That is just a start, but good start. Yeah. And that kind of thought process early enough when you engineer a material, not a product, yeah. engineer a material, could be beneficial. And it's just a thought I'm sharing. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, people in the U.S. have been aware of that suggestion. Or it, it, it's technically doable. The French do it. But, but the government of the United States had the balance to the question of, producing an excess of weapons-grade plutonium and its potential, potentially falling into the wrong hands. And they had to balance that with the question of, of, of burying the waste. And they made the choice to bury the waste. Uh, reprocessing is a, you know, it, it was, uh, I mentioned that there was a reprocessing facility built, so I think sometimes in the late 50s or early 60s in West Valley, New York. They were reprocessing fuel, but, the, but they ultimately got to the point where they realized that they had to make a fundamental decision. Would they go forward and reprocess all of the waste fuel from nuclear, nuclear reactors? It would surely decrease the volume of waste. There would still be waste, but it would, it would be a different volume than we're talking about, you know, 27 metric tons a year per 1,000 megawatts. It would be much different. But we, had the, we made the decision, unbalanced, not to reprocess. You know, I'm glad that we can not ship this waste to the other countries because electronic waste we ship to many other countries. Uh, old ships we have shipped to many other countries. They're lying around. Yeah. I'm glad we did not ship. No, that nuclear. would not. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I think Thank that, you. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. We, we can, we can let, let's hear it. It'd be easier if we had a microphone. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay, there you go. Working. You're on. Very good. 
Okay, so um, I just have one quick observation and maybe two questions from your presentation. So it seems to me that right now we have about 100,000 metric tons of fuel, or we're approaching there. Approaching it, yeah. And Yaka Mountain was about 70,000 metric tons. So it was designed for 70. To me, it seems that one Yaka Mountain is not enough anymore. So probably right. we're going to need two. Um, so the question I have is, it seems that DOE now is looking to what's called consent-based siting approach, which I believe Blue Ribbon Committee also recommended to do. Um, maybe you can share your opinion if you think that this approach, this new approach that DOE is seeking would be more successful. And what do you understand when they say consent? Consent based meaning that the public will have an option to decide whether they want to allow a repository to be built or not. I think conceptually that's a very good idea. When I said at the outset that this is largely a political problem, it is also a, it's a, it's a question of public will and political will. We know the Right now, the political will is not there. It just isn't happening. You know, we've had 60 years to deal with this waste, and it still hasn't happened <clears throat> in terms of congressional action. In, if you look at countries like Sweden, they are pretty close to having an operating deep geologic repository. I think the Swedes have been very ca cautious and careful about the way they approach the public uh, in terms of the acceptance of the notion. Uh, the Finns are close behind. They're both, they're different repositories in the sense that they're, they're planned to be in granite, which is a reducing environment. Yucca Mountain is actually a porous rock. It's actually uh, oxidizing. So the canister materials are quite different. In, in Sweden, um, the canisters can be copper alloys, much different alloy compositions. But the key is to get public acceptance. And that's what the Department of Energy is trying to do with uh, site-based management. I don't, I don't think they've been very successful. I know it's conceptually a good thing to do. I, I endorse that 100%. I just don't know if it's going to be successful in, in the current um, divisive world that represents the United States. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> pleased to see Cherenkov radiation. I'm sure Cherenkov would have been very pleased because he had to spend 25 days conditioning himself because, before he could see the radiation. <laughs> he, he spent 25 days in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Question yep. in the back? Yes. Just observation with respect to your thought about the roles of engineers uh, to become more involved in political yeah. thinking and helping others. I just point out that almost every professional society, as you look at their every professional engineering society, as you look at their code of ethics, there's a comment in there that says something. It's our obligation to help the public better understand and to yeah. educate the public. So I think, you know, not only just necessarily having to seek out political office, but to your point. Uh, just by being good proponents, helping people understand better. I think that's yeah. something we can all kind of carry forward, help people understand problems a little bit better, uh, particularly in a time where social media makes it so easy yeah. for different viewpoints you know, to be You know, when I, when, I, when I was in Washington during the year that I, <clears throat> that I served as an advisor to the Committee on Science and Technology, I met a lot of the people you're talking about. They're, people sponsored by professional societies who worked in congressional offices or in, cab uh, in cabinet, um, uh, uh, cabinet uh, D DOE offices, places like that. And uh, I think that was a good experience, but unfortunately it's a, it's a relatively small population. And I'll tell you, one, one of the things that I am most exhilarated by, and I don't get exhilarated too easy, but uh, is this, this forum that we, that I am a part of in my hometown. Uh, we, we, we have a group of guys, and I, I should point out there, I, maybe I've said this earlier today, but there's some Purdue alums in, among this group. They're technologists, chemical engineers, and one's a, a climatologist. I'm not sure what his degree is in. But, uh, you know, we, we get together every two weeks. We pick a topic. For example, I'll give you an example. We, we've been focused a lot on climate change for the last couple of months. So we had an expert who is concerned about CO2 emissions and sequestration and so on. He spoke. 
But we also decided we needed to hear from the, the, the other side of the equation, people who are climate skeptics. So we, we there's a, one of my former MIT colleagues, a guy named Richard uh, um, Lindzen, is actually very skeptical. He, he, he's not skeptical of the fact that cl the climate is changing. He's skeptical of that CO2 is responsible for it. Now, he gave a talk. We heard from someone else who has had the opposite views. And what we're going to try to do is to have a public debate on that issue. I mean this, a public for the whole town, not just a small group of science and technology folks. And we're going to, people are willing to do this because we think it's so important for the community to understand that part of technology. What, what is important for you looking forward? We don't want it to, you know, we don't want it to be any more political than it has to be. So we're going to try to get focused on is carbon dioxide responsible? We, we know there are climate oscillations that occur naturally with a cycle of something like 10,000 years. The real question is, are atmospheric contaminants produced from our anthropogenic industries, are they producing emissions that are adding to the, that are accelerating climate change? That's a question. We do know as engineers that there are symptoms that we have to deal with. Sea levels rising, that's a fact. You know, we're, we're going to start losing our, our, our uh, coastal cities in the, maybe in the next 50 years. What is New York shoreline going to look like? So we have to, I think it's important that we begin thinking about the consequences of what's occurring rather than pointing fingers at what's, who's responsible. You know, is it, is it industry? Is it industry? Is, is it because we're producing CO2 with our, our uh, from our, uh, the emissions of fossil uh, steam generator, uh, uh, electric generators. Um, but we've got to deal with it. But my point is, we're trying to engage the public. I, you know, I think if communities all over the country started doing something like that, that could be important. I know, we're just, we're just beginning to do this, but I really get excited. These guys are, you know, they're really wonderful people. They're not all guys, they're women too. They're, it, it really is a cross-section in many respects of our town. And we're trying to engage the public in scientific conversation. And I don't, I, I don't know how to deal with it. It's, it's a tough problem. But I do think it's important for the, anyone who has got an inclination to get involved in public policy, I, I, you got my support. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Marsha, do we have anything online? Okay. I, I'm going to, to borrow something from the last panel yeah. and, and bring it in here. I think it was Professor Kim who said something about all these uh, science fiction stories from, <laughs> from prior eras. And given the level of public understanding of science, yeah. that may be the level of understanding that most of the population has about these issues. Yeah. Given that, what would you say would be the role of your technologist groups to actually create, if you will, science fiction stories about what happens in these environments? So I can imagine a short-term one based on the headline, MIT in exile, uh, Cambridge campus evacuates yeah. due to the sea level rise. <laughs> You know, that's it's amazing. only about that's, four that's, feet above sea level. No, it, that's hard. true, yeah. But that's, that's how would you point. write a science fiction story about one of these, oh, we, we forgot to bury this stuff? You know, you raise a really interesting point. I, I remember being in Japan at about the time that people discovered the high temperature su uh, um, super, superconducting magnets, the oxide magnets. And I'm sitting on this subway car with a Japanese friend, and I'm looking across at a kid reading a magazine. And it's a magazine that was, it was like a comic book that had a lot of illustrations about superconducting magnets and levitated trains, and I, I thought that was really ingenious. That, that could be, you know, maybe, maybe this is the way that, I mean, if you consider magazines or social media as a vehicle for providing some common good, that might be a way. This is not disinformation. I got a hold of one of these magazines and I brought it home because I was, 
you know, some of my friends at MIT were very involved in the evolution of a company called American Superconductor, based on all of that. I brought this home and I gave it to him. He said, look, this is what the Japanese kids are reading. You, there was nothing like that in this country. And I was so impressed. But I like what you're saying. I mean, you know, we need to reach people at the, at the right age and at the right level. And these kids are absolutely absorbed. So, I don't know, that's a very interesting thought. It's a beginning. It's a beginning. Okay. okay. So, if there are no other questions, I believe we've come to the end of PEDALS from the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, I've gotten the sense that he really doesn't want me to do this. But I want to express my utmost appreciation to Professor Chandrasekhar, Chandy, yeah. for putting these things together. Oh, I can't agree more. Yes, absolutely. I, 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 need, I need to say a, just a few words about this. I've known Chandy for a long time. Back when Dale, Condit, uh, Dale Compton was here, and uh, some of my Martin Marietta friends who knew Dale and introduced me to him. But we, we have a mutual interest in things related to uh, environmental effects on mechanical behavior. He wants to, he's shown me that he can apply it to things like metal cutting. I'm interested in it from the point of view of environmentally induced fracture in, well, for example, a nuclear steam generator tube. But the coincidence and application to something like metal cutting on the one hand and environmental exposure of engineering materials on the other, it's magnificent. So we, we are working very hard to develop a collaboration that I hope will bring me onto this campus many times in the next few years. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I got to tell you, I had a great day here. The, I had wonderful visits with your faculty this morning, got some more tomorrow. But I, I especially I had a great visit with students. I, said, I know some of them are here in the room, but you guys have some great students here. You really do. We, we just had, we could have gone on for hours. You know, we, we had to stop because my calendar said I had to be somewhere else. But I, I just want to tell you how impressed I am by what I've seen in my day here. And I mean, I've been here a couple of occasions before, but I'm looking forward to coming back. So, Shandy, I thank you for that. It's great to have your collaboration and friendship and it is friendship. I've known him for a long time. He's not just a colleague, he's a friend. So thank you. Thank you, Chan. Thank you, and thank you for that um, endorsement of what we've come to want to call the pinnacle of excellence at scale. There you go. So, I like that. Thanks Good. again, everyone, for attending. <laughs> and we'll talk to you again sometime soon. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thank you.